Hey everybody, welcome to Sports Insider. I am Dan Lobby. He is, of course, Bud Shaw. No Chris Fedor again today, staying up late watching Cavs games. So Bud is going to fill in. We'll have Mary Kay Cabot on to talk Browns free agency, Chris Haynes to talk about the Cavaliers, and then Paul Hoynes will join us to talk Indian spring training. Uh, it's warming up here, so that means we'll probably have a snowstorm on opening day. It's getting really hot in Berea. <laughs> That's true. Let's talk about that now. We bring in Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter. How are you today, Mary Kay? I'm t a little tired. How are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. And I mean, let's get right to it. The, uh, the reports that just came out, obviously, a, a lot of talk about Colin Kaepernick possibly going to Denver, but now people are throwing in that maybe the Browns could be interested in Colin Kaepernick and to keep an eye on them. Is that real? Could the Browns really make an aggressive push for Kaepernick? Yeah, they really could. Um, and you know what? From everything that I've been able to tell in the last uh, five, ten minutes that, you know, that it is legit. I mean, I talked to someone who is involved uh, in the negotiations um, at some point around the country, <laughs> and um, that person believes that the Browns are also in the mix. So it's legit, and it's, um, it's probably happening fast and furious behind the scenes, and uh, the Browns, you know, they, they could end up with him, depending on um, you know, just depending on how everything shakes out. Mary Kay, what conclusions can we draw then about their evaluation of Wentz and Goff? Well, I don't know if it means that they won't go down that road either. I mean, perhaps, you know, they will uh, do something like that anyways, or maybe they have something in mind a little bit later. Maybe they liked someone else, like a, maybe a Paxton Lynch or something, and maybe they'd go, uh, you know, Kaepernick and, and start him for a couple of years, try to start him for a couple of years, and then uh, develop a Lynch into something and not give up that number uh, two overall pick on a quarterback. So, I, you know, I don't know exactly what it means yet. I would think that if, if they were going to go out and, and get a Colin Kaepernick, that they would do so with the notion that, that they're going to have him be their starting quarterback for a while. What would your expectations be on the cost of getting Colin Kaepernick? Um, you know, they're going to, they're going to have to give up a, a draft, you know, a significant draft pick, I would think, uh, that they, you know, now they're in a bidding war basically with, with the Jets and the Broncos. So, you know, the price goes up in that case, obviously. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure where it's at right now, but I'm guessing you'd have to give up a, you know, at least a, a second round pick or, uh, maybe a, a, you know, a couple of picks. I'm, I don't know that you'd go first. Um, but, you know, second, third, some combination. And then, you know, then you'd have to maybe work at some kind of, look at some kind of a, a contract extension. So, you know, maybe some of that's going on right now. Talk about all that. Uh, so it, it gets a little complicated, but, but I do believe they're in the mix. And know, Mary Kay, you talk about that compensation. And, I mean, you, you kind of alluded to this. It seems like if you went out and got that guy, even if you drafted him, that's a guy you're getting to be your starting quarterback, not just this year or next year. That's a guy you're getting to be your starter, you know, for a relatively long time. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he's, he'd, he'd be on the books right away for, um, you know, I believe it's over $11 million right away on the, uh, on the books by, guaranteed, I think, by April 1st. So, yeah, you're talking about a significant financial investment. Um, and, yeah, therefore, you would be looking at him as your number one guy. I, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around this. You know, three years ago, we were talking about Kaepernick and RG3, you know, revolutionizing the game. Um, clearly, that hasn't happened. They both lost their jobs at various times. In, in your opinion, is he more attractive than RG3 would be? Well, you know what? At this point, yes, I, I would say that that he is. I mean, RG3 comes with um, other issues. He's not necessarily a, a great locker room guy. Uh, I don't think that's the case with so much with, with Kaepernick. Um, and Hugh loves him. So I think that, that plays a big factor. You know, Hugh, Hugh Jackson wanted to draft him, thought he was the best quarterback coming out that year, you know, even though Cam Newton was the number one overall pick. So, you know, these things all play in. And, uh, you know, and, and, and who knows? I mean, I, I don't know if they left the combine thinking, hey, you know, one of these guys isn't going to be able to start for us for a few years or what the, the feeling is. I did hear it was legit that, that Jared Goff's 
um, interview did not go well with the Browns. I've heard that even though they have denied that, Hugh has denied that, I still have heard that it did not go well. So, you know, maybe they thought that he was going to be their guy, and now he's not. So it's all very fluid, very interesting, but, you know, there's something here. All right, Mary Kay, obviously the Browns had a difficult first day of free agency losing four guys, four starters, uh, to different teams. Uh, now as the market continues to develop and we get into kind of some of the secondary players, the lower money guys, do you expect the Browns to be active in, in trying to acquire some of these guys? You know what, yeah, now that the, the first wave and all the big money's over with, you know, they'll probably uh, plug a few holes with some second-tier guys. I mean, they, you know, they're going to need to. Uh, so, you know, I do think that there will be a couple of guys here and there. But they, they did what they said they were going to do. They exercised discipline. Now, I think that they, they probably really would have liked to have gotten Mitch Schwartz back, and that came right down to the wire. Mitch wanted to come back here. I have an explainer on this whole thing uh, up on Cleveland.com right now. But um, I, uh, you know, I, I know he really wanted to come back, and in the 11th hour came back to the Browns and, and wants to accept uh, the offer that they had put on the table before the combine, and the offer was no longer there. They had moved on. They thought he had moved on, and uh, they were on to, to different things. So it was unfortunate that they lost him because I know they wanted him back, and they wanted Trav back too, Travis Benjamin back too, but, you know, I don't – think that they wanted to pay him six million dollars a year well I, I don't understand something about the Schwartz thing if they wanted him back and he came back to them why did they take the offer off the table because at that point they they were done and they had moved on they had allocated money and resources and offers other places when he went out after he did not engage with them with their offer before the combine they were basically at that point in their minds almost done. And then I do think that there was another factor here. I think it could have gotten uh, sort of patched up yesterday, but when word broke that they pulled their offer off the table, um, I don't think that sat well with anyone. And I think that things broke down from there. And that sometimes that's all it takes in these delicate emotional negotiations uh, to tear something apart. And I, I kind of think that that's what happened. All right, Mary Kay, we appreciate the time. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mary Kay. Yeah, that really stood out to me when I was when I was reading Mary Kay's story uh, this morning. It, it almost feels like the Browns punished Mitchell Schwartz well, for, for going out and testing and free agency. And that's exactly what Sashi Brown was not supposed to be, right? He's supposed to be this great facilitator, a guy that doesn't have a lot of ego. And, and that's what I don't understand. It, I would love to know more. I, I don't doubt what Mary Kay's saying. I just would love to know more. How, if he wants to come back... How much money did they have out in promised offers to people? And why not pull one of those offers back? Call Wisniewski's people and say, guess what? We're not, you know, we're yeah. out of the market now. We're signing shorts. Yeah, I it's mean, not I, like they signed five other guys. We're yesterday. talking about a guy in his mid-20s who's never missed a game. I'm, I'm not saying he's the greatest player in the world, but he's certainly a guy worth keeping. All right, let's switch gears and talk Cavaliers. We bring in our Cavaliers beat reporter, Chris Haynes. Chris, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fine, guys. Hey, pardon if you hear, um, you know, interruption noise in the background. I'm outside LAX um, waiting for my hotel shuttle, so bear with me if you can. All right, no problem. That's life of an NBA beat reporter right there. All right, Chris, uh, you had an interesting post today about the game last night talking about how the Cavaliers uh, decided to force feed Kevin Love, how it might have almost cost them the game, but uh, how important is it for them to kind of get Kevin Love going again offensively? Yeah, no, it's very important. And it wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to knock or criticize Tyron Lue's uh, uh, game plan, uh, per se, but the reality was that they, they did go into the game plan trying to force me to love the ball. Uh, you know, LeBron James, when we asked him about it last night, he, he looked as if uh, it was a game plan that he wasn't too fond of. And um, you, you can tell in the second half, and he really took it over and, and, and went away from that. And I think if Kevin Love is going to be successful on a consistent basis, he's going to have to find his shots within the confines of the offense. And I think that's what we see happen once, once he hit that big four-point play down the stretch. Uh, so it, I don't know what it's going to take exactly to keep, to keep Kevin Love going. You see it every now and then. But I know four-speed hill while the defense was set, and, 
you know, making him have, you know, making him turn him into a playmaker, that that's just not the best recipe to get the best out of him. Chris, uh, there was a post game early in the season, a big Cavs win where Love played very well, where LeBron came out and said that Love was going to be the focus of the offense this year. Now here we are with about 20 games left in the season, and we're still talking about this. Why is it taking so long for this to happen? Yeah, number one, because Kevin Love was never, LeBron knew it, he was never going to be the focal point of the offense. <laughs> uh, he, he, he was saying that, well, you, you, you know, you know what was I doing. You know, he yeah. was saying that to try to boost up the confidence of Love, try to get, let Love know that, hey, I'm in your corner, I'm pulling for you, I'm, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to get you involved. Huh. Uh, but the simple fact is, man, I, I, some moments, man, Love just doesn't show up. It doesn't show up. Man. I think we're seeing, uh, you know, what the holes were in his game, you know, when he was in Minnesota. I, Minnesota, he, he was kind of sheltered. You know, he, there wasn't a lot of national te- televised games. If he didn't show up in Minnesota, it wasn't a big deal. And, and then in Minnesota, you know, if he wasn't having a great game, he could also pro- he could produce the numbers because, you know, he would still play the, the minutes necessary. Here, if he's not producing, there's a good chance he probably won't even play in the fourth quarter, you know, let alone down the stretch. So, I, you know, I just think that's Kevin Love's game, and everybody has to get used to it and, and accustomed to it. And if you got them going for a little bit, use them. If not, then go with something else. Chris, kind of along those lines, you know, there's about a, you know, a little over a month until the playoffs are going to start for the Cavaliers. We kind of know where they're going to end up in the East, most likely the number one seed, probably at worst the number two seed if Toronto were to catch them. But uh, between now and the start of the playoffs, not just Kevin Love, but in general, what does this team need to work on, and what does this team need to get right? You know what? I, I would like to say I would like to say this team is bored. They're, they're really bored with the regular season. It, it seems like they're just racing and trying not to get injured or you know have anything catastrophic occur to the postseason. So I, I, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and just say they're bored. I, I really do think, I still do think, with the talent they have, how you doing? Good inside. With the talent they have, they're still a, 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 a potent force in the, in the Eastern Conference. I, I, don't, I don't see any other team that can really beat them in a seven-game series. The only team that can beat them in the Eastern Conference is themselves. If they just start folding mentally, mental lapses, uh, uh, but I, I think the East is definitely there still to win with the child they have the roster. But they, they definitely have to work on some consistency. Chris, we know how good they were down the stretch last year, I think 33-6 and six or whatever going into the playoffs. Should it be a concern to Cavs fans if they don't get back to that level of basketball entering the playoffs? Or are they just, as you say, so good that no one can really touch them anyway until the finals? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I, I think they're that good. But the problem is, I, you know, but, you know, it's okay for me to say that. It's okay for me to say that they're, they're too good, don't have anything to worry about to the postseason. But if the Cavs start believing it, that, that's a problem. You know, so I think you want to see some level of consistency going into the postseason because you want that to carry on into it. Now, this team, you know, like I, I compliment them, you know, they're a talented team. They're still not beyond with folks. Like, they, they can be touched. You know, Toronto, they gave Toronto belief giving us those couple of wins throughout the regular season. And Toronto, they may be able to carry that belief into something. So we'll see. But, you know, I, I think I think they want to see some consistency uh, before the postseason hits. But, yeah, I'm just not sure with the way they're going to try to rest guys and, and the way things are going right now, I'm just not sure a long string is going to occur before then. Uh, Chris, last question here. You, you mentioned that the Cavaliers might be bored. I think they're probably not the only people that are, are bored with the NBA's regular season right now. We're hearing a lot of chatter about uh, big picture with this Cavs' big three. Can it work? You know, what do you think, long term, can this big three continue to work? Continue to work. I, I mean, look, with, with the expectations that are at hand, that, that, that question, I, I'm going to answer like LeBron's been saying the uh, last couple of weeks. That, that's a trick question. Because can it work? Yes, it can work if you're trying to be successful. You know, if you're trying to have a successful regular season, uh, you know, be number one or number two in the East. Can it work to win a championship? Um, you know, that's where I kind of like, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Especially when you look at Golden State and San Antonio over there. Any other, any other year, any other season, would this work? Maybe. I, I don't know. It, it's just, it's all about 
what your ultimate goal is. It, this is a very good team. Is it, a, is it a championship team? You know, I will argue that the, the mental psyche and, and the preparation of this team sometimes is off, and that doesn't resemble, uh, resemble a, a championship team. But, hey, they can get it together. It is not over. And we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, that's a trick question, man. But I, I think after, this, after the finals, if they can't win it, if they can't win the final this year with this team, I, I think you've got to go in a different direction. All right, Chris Haynes, our Cavaliers beat reporter. Thanks for the time, Chris. Uh, anytime, guys. Take care. Yep. I mean, it, it, he's right. It is kind of a trick question. And, of course, you know, you could also preface it by saying, has it worked to this point? Yeah, I mean, I think getting to an NBA Finals and, and being 45 and 18 would suggest it has. Mm -hmm. But we all know that there's something that's just not quite right there. You know, we can all agree on the NBA season is too long. It absolutely is. <laughs> kind of down to like 66. <laughs> was that what it was during the lockout year? Seed everybody one through 16. It would make things a lot more I agree. interesting. That'd be but fine. Uh, I think we're a ways away from that ever happening. Speaking of long regular seasons, let's talk a little baseball. We bring in our Indians beat reporter, Paul Hoynes. Hoynesy, how are you? Hi, guys. All right, Hoynesy. Um, all is pretty quiet on the Indians front, but there was the Austin Jackson news. I believe it was over the weekend, the White Sox landed Austin Jackson. Some Indians fans were a little upset that it wasn't the Indians that got him. Uh, what exactly happened with Jackson? Well, I think they were in on him. You know, they had talked to him. I think they was, he was one of those guys uh, that they talked to for, uh, you know, for much of the offseason. But uh, from what I heard, um, you know, they, they, they promised him pretty much every day, you know, at bats in Cleveland. Uh, but uh, Jackson wanted to stay in uh, Chicago. He had ended the last season with the Cubs in Chicago. And I think it would have cost the Indians more to get him to Cleveland than the one-year, $5 million deal he signed with the White Sox. Well, I know it's uh, not uh, you know, too long into spring training here, but uh, what are your impressions so far been of, of how much Napoli will be able to help these guys in the, in the batting order? I think he's going to help him a lot, Bud. Uh, this guy is, uh, you know, he swung the bat really well the first, you know, six, seven games of spring training. Um, he plays a decent first base. Uh, they, he kind of gives them the best of both worlds. They wanted right-handed power. Um, yeah, he, you know, he's done that throughout his career. He didn't have a great year last year, but he still had 18 home runs. Um, and he plays a decent first base. So you're not giving up a lot of, you know, defense uh, with their pitching staff when, when you put, when you run him out at first base and he's still a threat even though you know he's 35 36 to hit the ball out of the park uh best case scenario how many games does he play by the end of the year well i, I think they'd love to get him you know play him 140 150 games wow. you know and uh you know he's all he hasn't he hasn't been able to do that too much of his career but i think if they could play him you know, 100 games at first base or, you know, 90 to 100 games at first base, and he could split the rest of the time with the Santana and DH, you know, get him to – they would get him to that, those like 100 to 150 at-bats he, he seemingly always misses uh, during the season. Uh, Hoynesy, Tyler Naquin, obviously a young guy uh, that is turning some heads in spring training. There's an opportunity there for him. We've seen with the Indians in the past, though, that sometimes they've been hesitant to give their young guys and their prospects opportunities uh, in, in times when maybe they deem it a little too early. Uh, do you think that would change with Naquin? Is he a guy that has a real chance to make this roster? I think uh, he, he has a chance. I think uh, they'd love to see you know, their number one pick uh, in 2012 you know, be the opening day center fielder. Uh, on, on the flip side, I think they'll be cautious. You know, they've got a couple guys that have played a lot of center field in the big leagues. Uh, Will Venables in camp. Uh, you know, so they've got you know, Rajah Davis. They've got a lot of ways to cover that spot. Um, until, you know, until maybe, you know, midseason or something like that. But I, I really think uh, this kid's got a shot. Uh, I don't know. You know, I think, you know, I was told before, before camp opened that he didn't even have a chance to make it as a bench guy. So, you know, I think, you know, Nathan's like 25, I, I believe. You know, he's he hasn't played much above Triple A. I mean, much above Double A. But you know, he's had a good spring. I think the job is there for him to win. Let's say. 
Paul, speaking of cautious, uh, what do you think is the game plan with Brantley, uh, who by most accounts is ahead of schedule? Yeah, I've been told that uh, no, no, no matter what, I think he opens on the DL just to be you know, pretty cautious here, like you said, but I think they'll be very cautious, but he is ahead of schedule. He's supposed to hit, up, hit take, start taking BP uh, tomorrow or, or this weekend on the field. Um, you know, so what are they? They're like, uh, you know, almost two weeks in the camp. So, you know, you, you can't, you've still got to make up those games. You know, he's basically, you know, he's been on his own program, but he's still got to go through a whole spring training. He's, it's not like he's going to start playing, you know, two, uh, you know, next Monday. Uh, so, you know, even if they got him in the games, some kind of games by, you know, the, like the 25th or 26th, he's still not going to be ready. So, um, you know, I think he'll open on the DL. Wednesday, last question here. Uh, it's been a quiet spring training for the Indians. Is that a good thing for this team heading into the regular season? Yeah, you know, I think uh, fewer injuries, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, knock on wood. You know, they're not, they're still, they still got quite a ways to go in camp. Uh, but uh, quiet spring, I think, uh, you know, they, they brought in three veteran right-handers that, you know, in, in a perfect world, should help the club. And, in, in, uh, you know, Uribe, Napoli, and, and Rajat Davis, uh, you know, their starting pitching has looked fine. You know, all four guys, have ta- all four, you know, all five guys or four guys, the top four guys have taken at least one turn and uh, have, look, have looked good. Uh, the bullpen, you know, there's a lot of competition there. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, it's been a quiet spring, but so far a productive spring and uh, a, no, a, a spring with no surprises, and usually that's the best pack. All right, Lindsay, we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Paul. All right, bud. Time for some spinoffs. All right, well, I guess I'm ready. <laughs> as ready as I'll ever be. You know, our story on why the Browns didn't immediately waive Johnny Manziel Wednesday elicited hundreds of comments, only a few of which had anything to do with Johnny Manziel. That fed my belief that the wave Manziel now frenzy on Wednesday was basically a media firestorm and nothing else. Most people, I think, turned the page on Manziel after the Vegas thing, or was it the Dallas domestic abuse charges, or Hugh Jackson telling the media at the scouting combine, haven't we already talked enough about him? Great question. What's the difference if Manziel departs today, or Friday, or if it's not an outright waiver, but a trade. There's not much interest in Manziel's status beyond using it as a punchline. Maybe Denver can take him because they lost their quarterback? That, I think, is a joke, right? Browns fans rightly understand that far more pressing issues were raised on the first day of free agency. The Browns kept none of their free agents after telling everyone that it was important to keep their free agents. That sent the message, rightly or wrongly, that the free Uh, agent game was a little too fast for the rookies in the front office. The unconventional front office was as advertised on the first day of free agency. We just don't have the comfort of believing it was by design. What happened makes the drum beat louder for the draft. The suspense and the trepidation grows. Satch tells us he's 73, been a Browns fan all his life, and he's tired of the mess. The fans seem to understand, even as the media obscures the fact, that officially subtracting Manziel doesn't change two decades of futility. I'm exaggerating it. It's only been 17 years. (laughs) Feel better? Dan? Yeah. uh, A lot of people wanted Johnny gone right at four. I understand that a little bit, but... Well, my argument, I guess, and I had it with a couple of guys who cover the Browns uh, on a regular basis, was they thought that it compromised the the message hmm. and I I mean there's no one in the building right now if yeah, there was a right. mini camp this weekend and he was still walking around there I think that would have been a bad a bad look for everybody the fact that everybody in the league everybody in that locker room knows he's gone I mean I think they should want people should want a front office that doesn't fly off the handle and do crazy things if they can do smarter things right like if, if you don't like the way a player is playing during a regular season and you, you set the precedent that you're, gonna, you're not going to tolerate Johnny Manziel. So do you then just cut whoever it is and absorb the, cap, the salary cap hit? No, you would look to, to, uh, 
to make a deal to move that player and do whatever you could. And I think that's what they're trying to do. I don't think they have much chance of making it happen. And, and I think it would be different if they had just been quiet about Manziel and said, well, we're not going to comment on sure, Johnny. Sure, exactly. But they made their strong statement. Uh, even at the Combine, their no comments about referred, Johnny were actually yes. very strong. They've no referred comments. back to that statement. Yeah. There's no one who should think for a second that he's going to still be part of this team. And as long as that's the understanding, I, whatever happens procedurally, I don't have a problem with. Well, we're still deciding on Fedor if he's going to be back on the show. We'll see. <laughs> for now, it was Bud Shaw today. Our thanks to Mary Kay Cabot, Chris Haynes, who just got off the plane before we called him. We appreciate that. And, of course, Paul Hoynes. I'm Dan Lobby. Thanks for watching.